Hi, I'm Jennifer Elrod. I'm a judge on the Fifth Circuit. And I am delighted to be hosting this panel, Conservative Public Interest Litigation in the Modern Era. Some of you may be saying, what is conservative public interest litigation? I'm sure our learned panelists will explain that for us. Um, a number of organizations have engaged in litigation against what they perceive as regulatory abuse and overreach in the last three decades. Uh, Professor Murray has even written a book by the people calling for a Madison fund to expand the fight against the regulatory state. At issue is whether the election of a, a deregulatory de um, leaning administration moots these efforts, or is there still more work to be done? Will some states take on the regulatory mantle and so the litigation will move into state courts? And also, can you, that one other issue that we're gonna talk about for you law students in the room is can you actually make a living as a conservative public interest lawyer? Stay tuned, you might learn about that as well. Very pleased to have a very learned panel today. First, we have Professor Michael Grieva. Professor Grieva joined the faculty of the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Don't you like to say that? The Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. I like to say that. In the fall of 2012, after having served as the John G. Searle Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specialized in constitutional law, courts, and business regulation, and served as the chairman of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He is a prolific writer, author of nine books and a multitude of articles, and he has provided congressional and state legislative testimony, has lobbied and consulted in federal agency proceedings, and has provided litigation services in over 30 cases, including matters before the Supreme Court. Welcome, Professor Grieva. You can, you can clap. <laughs> Our next speaker today is Kate Todd. Kate Todd is the former senior vice president and chief counsel for the U.S. Chamber Litigation Center, which is the litigation arm of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. She has a broad range of government and private sector experience with particular expertise in federal appellate practice and constitutional law. She has worked in the White House, she has been a, a partner uh, in appellate litigation and communications practice of, practice of a prominent law firm. And she has clerked for the Associate Justice Clarence Thomas. And she also served as the executive editor of Harvard Law Review. You've heard of that. She received her undergraduate degree in government, history, and international relations from Cornell, and she lives in Virginia, and we're very happy to have Kate and her expertise on our panel today. Our next panelist is Ted Frank, senior attorney and director of the Center for Class Action Fairness. Before it merged with CEI in October 2015, he founded and ran CCAF as a nonprofit public interest law firm in 2009. He's won landmark appeals and lots and lots of money for consumers and other plaintiffs through his class action work. He has been called the leading critic of abusive class action settlements and the American Lawyer Litigation Daily referred to him as the indefatigable scourge of underwhelming class action settlements. I like that word, indefatigable. <laughs> uh, Ted clerked for the Honorable Frank H. Easterbrook for the Seventh Circuit and was a litigator for 10 years until he won a sizable windfall in the World Series of Poker. That's a topic for another day, <laughs> but definitely a topic. He's a frequent public speaker and he's testified by, before Congress many times. We're very grateful to have Ted here to, to, to illumine us. Thank you. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, is Mr. Mark Smith. 
Mark is familiar with all aspects of conservative public interest litigation, having advised clients and donors in a broad range of matters from high-profile litigations to confidential representations. Only months after he started practicing law, Mark and his clients were the subject of a New York Times article discussing their case, which raised a constitutional challenge to an economic regulation. A mere three months later, Mark appeared again in the New York Times, except this time on a cover story about he, as co-counsel, set a jury trial record for the largest jury verdict ever against a New York City co-op building for race discrimination. Since then, he has litigated cases involving billions of dollars, including trying the largest no-fault trial in American history for tens of millions of dollars against over 50 insurance companies. Most recently, he served as the media surrogate for the Donald Trump for President campaign and also served on the President's transition team. Please welcome Mark Smith. Our, our panelists are each going to give a few remarks. Then we will have some interaction between the panelists. And then, as always, we will take questions from the audience. And I may ask a few questions, too. Thank you. We do the sitting down, right? Um, uh, thanks, Judge, for the generous introduction. Um, thanks to the Federalist Society for inviting me. I actually used to do public interest litigation, but that was in the pre-modern era. And I'm sort of speaking more or less as sort of an observer uh, of, of the scenery. So I have a few remarks on what I think has changed in public interest litigation uh, over the decades and um, how sort of it fits into the broader framework of conservative libertarian politics. Uh, the model we used to have back then, the 90s, um, the playbook which we had inherited from the left was to discredit institutions and to sort of amp up the volume of public debate, right? So think of the affirmative action cases against universities. Um, Right, these places were run by overpaid cowards who sort of stifled any kind of debate about their projects and their policies under a cone of silence. We had to take these people down, no regrets. Uh, in <laughs> some areas, that is still, it seems to me, has to be the agenda. So the higher ed, OCR, sexual harassment cartel, which, you know, the ed blob will, you know, continue with or without. CR. That's a fine example. I say go out there, litigate against these people. Um, that's a stable job because university administrators cannot be shamed. Um, but I think in, in other domains we may want to entertain a somewhat different thought. Um, just which institution do you think we can still discredit that hasn't already done that all by itself? Um, and I wonder how much more you can sort of amp up the volume on public debate beyond sort of Ingram After Dark or whatever these programs um, are called. Um, so we've always, it seems to me, stood for reasoned constitutional politics. We've rejected political nihilism. Um, we have rejected incendiary diatribes and stood for reasoned debate and I think we should continue to do that, and maybe consistent with that program, we have to find ways of re-legitimizing um, political institutions or public institutions and sort of generate a debate that's actually worth having. How do you do that? Well, for one thing, you can staff government agencies with people who are committed to lawful government, to effective government, and to communicating their agency's mission with a great deal of plausibility, and incredibly, that's happening. Um, our anti-administrativist friends um, are, in fact, re-legitimizing the instruments of lawful, proficient government quite deliberately. And, you know, we have people like that um, and an intellectual reservoir on which they can build um, because of patient work and effort over decades and decades, much of it, um, most of it actually, um, procured under the Federalist Society's umbrella and penumbra. And, but for that investment of effort and thought, 
uh, and reason debate, this country might by now be Venezuela. Um, what can public interest law contribute to this accomplishment? I will save sort of more tactical questions about how do you litigate it under conditions where the agencies basically are copacetic. I will save that for Q&A and just say a few words on, on some broader questions. Um, litigation always looks adversarial and in your face, right? So you wonder how can that contribute to legitimating institutions and reasoned debate in lots of ways, actually, and to sort of just give you a few examples, right? Ted Frank has sort of one cases where missing half inch of a Subway sandwich is worth several million dollars to the lawyers on each side. Um, the Institute for Justice has litigated hundreds of these hair braiding licensing cases and won most. Pacific Legal has successfully litigated cases like Sackett where you need a permit and you never get it and the permitting requirements effectively destroy the value of your property. There are lots and lots of examples like that. And what I think they illustrate is the somewhat ambivalent nature of litigation, right? Of course you want to take the bastards down, that's the point. Um, but you also want to sort of recenter a public debate. And what the examples I just gave you have in common is that they are, that they involve adjudication rather than sort of pre-enforcement review of gargantuan agency rulemakings, right? That is always going to be sort of an interest group sport. Um, we had to do those cases during the Obama administration, but the debate around those things always involves, disintegrates, I think, quickly into abstractions or sort of ho hopeless confusion. It's much easier to have a reasonable debate about the question of whether this agency can do that to you in particular. And there's some evidence, I think, that that, that, that focus has already helped to reorient the academic debate and, and reform public institutions in a, in a good way. My main worry in terms of sort of re-legitimizing institutions and promoting a less sort of incendiary debate is actually about something a little bit different. It's about religion and culture. We used to have a Lockean consensus in this country, which among other things said that uh, we will not weaponize the administrative state and go to war against religion. That consensus has collapsed, collapsed, that is over, and so now you see organizations defending religious freedom sort of on the grounds that, no, wait a minute, the little sisters of the poor need an exemption, or wait a minute, I'm not a baker, I'm actually an artist. Um, why is it so hard in that context to sort of make litigation work to re-legitimate institutions, to reground public debate? To my mind, the right not to deal is the foundation of a free society, and that's true whether you're an artist or a baker and whether you're religious or not. You want to re-legitimate that principle and that institution of a free society before you obsess over Chevron's metaphysics. Um, but we don't have quite the nerve to say that and to re-legitimate the institutions that sort of spring from spontaneous natural order, and I think going forward that's the biggest challenge we face. Thank you very much. Kate, do you have some thoughts? Thank you, um, thank you Judge Elrod, and I, a particular, am I on? A particular pleasure, am I on? Here, why don't you, you can, here we go. It's a particular pleasure to be on a panel with you, one of the bright spots in those last uh, dark days of the Bush administration trying to get judicial nominations through. Um, I spent much of my time at these conventions seeing the faces of those who didn't make it and the judiciary that might have been. So uh, thank you for your service. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your service in helping me. Thank you. Um, I, first, I'll start with some disclaimers. I am not here on behalf of the U.S. Chamber or speaking for the U.S. Chamber, nor do I am I privy to any of the details, really, of the current strategic agenda of the Litigation Center. Um, nor, of course, do I think that one should equate the business community public interest agenda with the conservative public interest agenda necessarily. Um, but certainly during the Obama administration years, and particularly in the waning days of the administration, I think the agenda for the business community very significantly overlapped and had some pretty high synergies with the conservative public uh, interest litigation agenda. 
um, you know, where you have uh, just absolutely um, outrageous overregulation, you tend to have a lot of groups that come together and nothing quite uh, brings everybody together in litigation or otherwise, um, like that sort of determined enemy that I think so many saw in the Obama administration. Um, I'm not gonna uh, go back as far as to the 90s. I just wanna go back to uh, the election um, last year and say, at least from looking at it from the business community perspective, um, on election day and before election day, um, you know, certainly the U.S. Chamber itself had about two dozen pending pieces of litigation uh, across a whole uh, slew of subjects, a whole, uh, you know, a hodgepodge of administrative agencies. Um, and, and, you know, the regulations were terrible, and they were so deliciously terrible as a litigator that they were really dream targets in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I think it's worth remembering, remember, you know, it's the EPA's Clean Power Plan that generated the unprecedented stay out of the Supreme Court um, where the D.C. Circuit wouldn't do that job, um, one of the last acts of, of Justice Scalia judicially. Um, and it was also really the overreach of the Obama administration that I think really got numerous Supreme Court justices, those that or, weren't necessarily already headed that direction to really rethink um, some foundational principles of administrative law and the deference issue. So, um, you know, in that respect, I guess we do have um, the last administration to thank for uh, getting us all to focus on these very important topics and, and maybe Richard Cordray for making it sexy again to talk about Humphrey's executor. Um, the, the challenges then were really a, a combination of one sort of triaging the regulatory overreach and garnering the resources to fight so many battles on so many fronts. Uh, recognizing that the president had really succeeded in doing some pretty substantial shifts within the federal judiciary and making that question and the strategic call as to where to file, where you could find a venue that you would have some openness to hearing uh, challenges to centerpiece regulatory litigation, uh, legislation or regulation um, was really a central part of our litigation strategy. Um, and then of course you're always struggling with the questions anybody has when you're filing a big lawsuit, whether to seek preliminary injunctions and, and really struggling with the legitimacy and, and desirability of seeking nationwide stays, which look a little bit different today than they did at the time, and all the while trying to maintain peace among uh, co coalitions that were really very varied groups with a lot of different interests and a lot of different ways of trying to approach any particular piece of, of litigation. So there was lots to do. I think there were a tremendous number of righteous arguments and there was some good recognition, at least at the top at the Supreme Court, that there was a, a regulatory train um, going off the rails. Uh, but there was also the prospect at that time uh, that the judiciary wasn't get, gonna get any better. So good arguments, but you were probably gonna lose. So enter the election, you all know what happened. Um, and and I, I think it's worth talking about this sort of interim period because I don't think the real shift into the modern era has necessarily fully happened just yet. And, and I'll insert a particular note on public interest litigation as an advocacy tool for anyone who has been on the business end of public interest litigation. Um, you know, there are some very important and critical rules for suing, a lot of uh, boxes you have to check in terms of your justiciability issues, um, but also high among them is the rule that you need to get your money, your financing, your fundraising done up front before you file the complaint. Um, and, and that's because litigation takes a heck of a long time. Uh, it's very unpredictable. It takes twists and turns. People aren't quite expecting. Um, you can't generally shift or turn on a dime in your strategy the way that you might be able to in a sort of lobbying approach. So it's powerful, highly effective, uh, but, but not the most nimble of tools in the advocacy arsenal. And, and this can be frustrating to those whose primary advocacy tools aren't litigation. And I think you had a lot, and you continue to have a lot of groups that are trying to fight on a lot of different fronts. And so why does this all matter? I think it's because there was a lot of euphoria after uh, the election, and perhaps justified um, to some degree substantively about where regulations would end up. Uh, but not necessarily always appreciating not just the amount of time it takes to turn the ship 
as a regulatory matter, but also how difficult it can be to untangle and unwind um, litigation. So where there were stays in place, of course, this was great. Um, it kept the pressure on and, uh, to, to do something, but gave some breathing room to the new administration. Um, but it was still litigation over which there was not complete control by the government or the petitioners. I, I know certainly um, from where we sat at the, at the chamber, you know, one of the hardest things in our litigation was trying to find new personnel on the other end of the phone to talk to you about the litigation. It takes time to put people in. It has an effect on some of the interim types of, of logistics and scheduling and stays and et cetera in the litigation. Um, also, of course, continue to be uh, entrenched pressures within the agencies trying to convince the newcomers that the institutional interests outweighed whatever the policy initiatives were going to be, and there was the CFPB, which did whatever the hell it wanted to do. Um, so, you know, all the while, you had new fuel, new life, new energy put into all of the other advocacy tools. Um, and so everybody else who had, for a very long time, although we all thought of litigation as a last resort, it was a last resort we were running to time and time again because it was all we had. Um, you know, there's sort of a little bit of a feeling not to denigrate the, the, the types of litigation was, that was brought, but that it's starting to feel a little stale because there's a lot of other games going on in town. Um, and so that's why I mentioned that whole money piece and making sure people understand, like, you're, once you file litigation, you're in it for, for a long haul until, uh, until it really gets resolved, and, and it's just a reality of the litigation tool. Um, so I'll just say a, a few brief comments on the, the modern era and what I see sort of ahead. Um, and, and for the business community, I think it's pretty simple, and I think it's some of what Judge Elrod sort of foreshadowed in, in, in her introduction. You know, it's most likely that we will see a shift away from having a lot of affirmative federal regulatory challenges brought. You will see a shift to having the business community appear much more as an intervener or as an amicus. You saw that in, the, in, in you know, bucking up uh, deregulatory executive orders, for example. Um, it's nice to be defending for a change, but it also means that we might be, or the business community might be much more frequently in venues not of their choosing. So I think you're going to see a further development of administrative law in circuits where, where certainly had the business community been filing first, they wouldn't have chosen. Um, of course, the business community has been known to challenge Republican administrations. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a higher perceived cost to going into the courtroom when it's folks that you otherwise think are going to be doing some good things for you across other fronts. So I think, you know, while obviously if you just look at policy issues and not current litigation, you see NAFTA, immigration as, as both possible areas um, where you could have suits. Um, the third thing also mentioned, you know, was that I think you'll see a shift to state and local. You already seeing that a little bit. The activism will just move to a different place. It's much more dispersed. It's much harder to get your arms around. Um, and finally, I could imagine uh, that with the current administration's agenda that you know, certainly companies will individually feel more compelled to get involved in even more social issues than they've dipped their toes into in the last few years, and there might be some additional pressure to push business groups outside of what I consider the traditional business role into, into some of those issues. And finally, I just want to put uh, a few ideas on the table that I think are challenges more broadly for the conservative public interest uh, beyond the business community. I, I, I am not normally a, um, a very Pollyannish uh, person, but I'm, I'm very optimistic about this moment. I think the combination of the, administrative, uh, the administration's agenda, the judicial nominees in the pipeline, the judicial nominees who've already been confirmed, um, and the sort of focus on the administrative state right now is where the rubber meets the road. And I'm very, very hopeful that we'll move beyond sort of nipping around the edges and sort of using the palliative APA um, to striking more structural blows at, at the administrative state. Um, but I do think that the challenge, the biggest challenge in the, this modern era may be that each conservative group has to really figure out what it's its ultimate true aim is. And it's much easier to fight something when the policy principles and constitutional underpinnings all are badly done. And you can say, that's bad. We need to take it down. And it's much, much more difficult to separate out when perhaps the policies 
and the principles and the underlying constitutional issues aren't all pointing in the same direction. And we can sort of chuckle at the left's newfound embrace of federalism, but it's something that conservative groups are gonna have to embrace, and they're gonna have to embrace what they care about in policies and what they care about on methodology. And I think that's, that's really one of the big challenges going forward. You're not gonna see big coalitions. You're gonna see a lot more focused strategic litigation and you should figure out which group it is whose mission you most wanna support and get behind them no matter what they have to fight through. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Ted? Thank you. It's a privilege and an honor, of course, to speak at the Federalist Society with so many um, amazing panelists and speakers, and, and it's a, a real privilege to have such a full room here when there are so many competing events uh, at, at, at this time slot. Uh, I'd like to talk about the, the idea of forming a conservative public interest litigation group and, and what I've done to do that and what we'll be doing at, at, at the Competitive Enterprise Institute with that. And when I started the Center for Class Action Fairness in 2009, it, it was a question of looking for a, a, a niche that, that there, there, there wasn't anybody uh, doing what we were doing, but uh, the, the, the incentives needed to be there to, to, uh, to, to move the law in the right direction, but at the same time do this with a, a couple of animating principles behind it. And, and, and one I think was very important and Kate sort of alluded to is, is being able to show bang for the buck to donors. You, you can't do this without uh, money behind it and, uh, and, and donors have all sorts of opportunities to be giving money to all sorts of really good causes and, and you have to be able to show them that what uh, they're giving money for, you're, you're gonna do, you're, you're gonna stretch that dollar as, as much as you can and, and accomplish as much as you can with it. Uh, and and uh, really uh, work on that, and 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 that means in terms of triaging what sort of cases you're taking, finding the cases that that can create the most precedent, that will have the most impact, thinking ahead at, at, at the case selection, uh, not what an individual result will be, but you know what what is 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 the time commitment versus what are the the, the potential impacts? Is there a cert petition? Uh, that you can think of three years down the road, win or lose, and, uh, and, 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 and part of that, it, it, it was also the second animating f feature, which is, you know, sort of create a, a dream job for attorneys working with you. And, and I think that's important on the bang for the buck metric because you, you really have to money ball it. You really have to find attorneys who are willing to take the sacrifice, take the pay cut to, to do conservative public interest litigation. They're giving up a lot of money uh, to do that instead of uh, working at a large law firm. And uh, the, 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 the problem is, of course, when you're doing conservative public interest litigation is, is that the, the, the attorneys willing to do it are, are, are perfectly happy uh, uh, being in an environment where they're making money and, 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 and uh, defending people that can afford to pay big law prices. So you, you have to offer some sort of alternative that, that makes it worthwhile for them. And, and so we, we created an atmosphere where people could work from home and, 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 and have a work-life balance. We have uh, my, my uh, number two and number three attorneys are, are both uh, stay-at-home moms with four and three kids respectively. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, give them autonomy and, and opportunities that they wouldn't have uh, at, at a big law firm. So, you know, we, we have this big docket and people are working as maybe as hard as they are at big law, not putting in the hours, but, you know, intensity of, of what they're doing. Uh, but we've had four different attorneys getting to argue appeals and, and we, we, we have a giant docket of, of a couple of dozen cases, including a, a dozen appeals appending at any time. 
and 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 that gives them just real opportunities and 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 because of that we get really good attorneys working for us um, and so it was exciting to be able to take this program uh, and merge it into the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And it's uh, what Michael Grieve calls its anti-administrative uh, project that uh, uh, Jillian Metzger was talking about uh, in the previous panel in her recent Harvard Law Review article. Uh, CEI, of course, had the, the Free Enterprise Fund case and, and King versus Burwell. And, and we're looking forward to sort of expanding what we were doing uh, the model we, we had at, at, at the Center for Class Action Fairness to, to uh, tackling the, the regulatory state at CEI. And uh, I, I think there's some interesting opportunities there. Uh, in, in particular, uh, the regulatory state and, and its use of the litigation process to uh, sort of accomplish legislative ends that they would not be able to do uh, through congressional authorization. And as an example, something as simple as um, the Volkswagen diesel case, and a large part of that settlement was not money going to the Treasury, but money going to a DOJ slash EPA program over a billion dollars that Congress had explicitly rejected on multiple occasions uh, in, in terms of funding uh, some sort of um, uh, uh, zero emissions vehicle program uh, and, and Congress said no in terms of what we want to do on emissions, we want to do different programs and we're going to refuse the administration's request to fund a half billion dollars for it and instead the DOJ and the EPA took that and, 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 and got Volkswagen to fund it for a billion dollars uh, and, and those sort of slush fund cases uh, where, in fact, uh, the, the litigators are sort of creating policy different than what Congress wanted without congressional authorization is something we're, we're looking forward to, to fighting against. Uh, and so we have a petition pending uh, with the Federal uh, Communications Commission where uh, to uh, condition a merger uh, between Charter and a number of other cable companies, uh, they required a lot of uh, uh, conditions, regulatory conditions, that had the FCC tried to put those through as part of a rulemaking through the APA process, it never would have stood up. But they're saying, uh, well, we won't agree to this merger and we'll, we'll, we'll put you through a fight unless you agree to this regulatory program. Uh, that's completely outside of our authorization and has nothing to do with the sort of competitive concerns that we hypothetically have that would stop the merger. And so we're, and, and uh, current FCC chair and then just FCC board member, uh, Aji Pai had, had, had a, a very interesting dissent uh, flagging the problems that this was creating. And, and so we, we took that on behalf of a, a number of consumers and we challenged it before the FCC and it'll eventually go to the DC circuit, I imagine. But uh, cabining the regulatory agency there, I think is very uh, important and something nobody else was doing. Uh, and uh, the, how does the Trump administration affect that? Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, for all the complaints that uh, Trump was going to be this uh, uh, new fascist and, and, and broad executive power, in, in fact, the administration sort of unilaterally disarming. We had uh, Jeff Sessions uh, end the DOJ slush fund process of DOJ settling and then funneling money to third party organizations. So under the Obama administration, you would have these gigantic multi-billion dollar settlements uh, with banks over supposed mortgage problems. Uh, and I, I, I see I'm running short on time here, but, um, uh, and, and instead it would get funneled to, to left wing groups at, at, and then the banks would get credited $2 for every dollar that they would send to the group. And, they were assured, please don't send it to the right-wing groups. Please don't send it to the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, that won't happen under the current administration. Now we won't have those settlements at all. So we won't have the opportunity to challenge that in the courts, but uh, unless Congress steps in 
and, and, and permanently regulates that, uh, those opportunities will present themselves again. But I, I, I agree with Kate that you need to stand by your principles and not just look at, at, at uh, the consequentialist aspects. Uh, is it our side that's winning or, or losing? But look at the, the, the larger principles of good governance and, and the constitutional structure. So Mark, is there room for a consequentialist approach? I was taught at a young age that if you're a lawyer and there's a judge in the room, you should stand when you speak, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> and be before I address the question, I just want to say that uh, um, as, a New York, as a guy that lives and works in New York City in Midtown Manhattan for two decades, and went to NYU Law School, I've been at Rock Center for Christmas, I've been in uh, Times Square for New Year's Eve, I've been to several Super Bowls, and I will tell you this, I have never been in a room so crowded with so many people than out there. <laughs> and I want to say that thank God for that, because I think that the crowd here shows the expansion and the growth of the vast right-wing conspiracy, and I can't think of a better, a better thing for America than that. Well, I, um, I'm a professional trial lawyer. I fight to win, that's what I do, and I care about winning more than anything else as long as it's lawful and ethical. Um, and there's no doubt that the conservative public interest approach based on donors and pro bono is great, but it's extremely limited because there's only so many donors and so many opportunities to pursue our agenda. So my approach is different, and I'd like to submit that you think it through differently. The question is, how can we as conservatives generate more legal attacks on the left, liberal institutions, on greater issues with more plaintiffs and more jurisdictions? And I submit that the way we do this is to actually engage America's Lawsuit, Inc., the plaintiff's bar, as well as the new and growing areas and in industry of litigation finance. Now, let's start by talking about how do we use America's lawsuit industry to our advantage? Now look, I'm a longtime conservative, okay? I, we all generally view the plaintiff's bar as political enemies, right? We view them as political liberals who bring frivolous lawsuits and impose unnecessary litigation taxes on all of us in society. And the truth is, those criticisms are absolutely valid. There are too many lawyers, there are too many lawsuits, there are too many laws and regulations, and the consequence of this, of course, is that the United, you know, that the U.S. ship capitalism is weighed down by all these barnacles. But like it or not, the reality is that America's litigation industry is here to stay. The lawsuit industry in America is, is, is wealthy, they're politically influential, and they're going nowhere. This is our reality. Yet, though this is our reality, I think that really their existence is no different than some other you know, natural elements such as rain, wind, and sun. While these are powerful forces that can be dangerous to people and to property, I think they can also be harnessed for positive purposes for the conservative movement in America. So the question is, can we conservatives find ways to use the plaintiff's bar and people that sue for a living to our advantage? Now, my answer is unequivocally yes. And to answer this question, I would like to um, pay homage to the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, to go outside of the United States briefly to make my legal point here in America. <laughs> Specifically, I want to go south of the border to the Amazon River, where we find that very famous fish called the piranha. Now, piranha live in schools. In fact, actually, I think they're homeschooled, but I digress. <laughs> piranha live in schools, and they have razor-like teeth that tear flesh from their prey as they eat it. Piranhas have been known and reported to eat fish, cows, and yes, even humans. But I think there's something particularly opposite about the piranha in today's panel discussion. You see, piranha 
are cannibals. They will eat other piranha if they can get away with it. And usually piranha will eat other piranha when the other piranha is in distress and vulnerable. And this usually occurs when the piranha, by the way, is hooked on a line of a local fisherman and then all the other piranhas get, a, get together and they eat their buddy before the fisherman can pull them into the boat. Now remarkably, the species here in the United States that most resembles the piranha is the American trial lawyer. <laughs> and just like the piranha, the trial bar in the United States is more than happy to eat its own if there is money to be made in doing so. Don't believe me? Well, let us spend exactly 10 seconds looking at the newspaper now and realize that prominent liberal lawyers as we speak, including none other than I believe Gloria Allred, are suing the liberal god of Hollywood, Harvey Weinstein, for money <laughs> over allegations of sexual misconduct. There are currently lawsuits by trial lawyers against CNN, the Clinton News Network, and the New York Times for discrimination. And these are just a handful of examples that you can find in the papers on a daily basis. But why would these sort of generally liberal lawyers who do liberal things that conservative groups tend to criticize, why are they suing? Now, come on, it's simple. They want to make money, right? Make money. So the lesson that I want to convey today is that if we show any lawyers, including liberal lawyers, plaintiff's lawyers, a pot of gold and how to get them to that end of that rain road, then voila, guess what? We have them hooked. And this is because their industry, like every other industry, is always looking for new opportunities and markets to exploit. So let's, that, so as conservatives, I think we should begin to look for reasons and explanations for plaintiff's lawyers, frankly, to sue on our behalf. Not because they like us, not because they're members of the Federalist Society, but because they want to make money. On a related note, I just want to say that there's a sort of sister arrangement here that, is, that we should consider tapping into, and that's the litigation finance industry. Um, the best example of this, of course, is a situation where, you know, Ted references that you need donor dollars. You don't need donor dollars if people are willing to spend money and invest in lawsuits because they can make a profit. Those effectively become your donors even though they're not donors, they're investors. And the best example of how a apolitical lawsuit brought against liberal organizations can do good for us is I think the Peter Thiel financer in part of the lawsuit by Hulk Hogan against Gawker. So Gawker was generally viewed as kind of a liberal you know, website and whatnot, and it no longer exists in the same way it did because Hulk Hogan, with litigation finance help apparently, basically destroyed it. Again, an advance for the conservative movement, even though the motive was all about money. <coughs> so how can we deploy the plaintiff's bar in litigation finance to win for conservatives? Um, I'm not, I don't have all the answers to this, but I'm going to give you a couple examples of what I've thought of. And I'm, you can all come up with yours, and that's what I'm encouraging you to do in your localities. So the first one I call is Operation Safe Space. This is a potential profit center that identifies those individuals that have worked at liberal, liberal and politically correct companies and perhaps have been discriminated against in their employment. So, for example, people under New York, certain New York civil rights laws, if uh, someone, your employer discriminates against you, because of your uh, political affiliations outside of the workplace, you have potential civil rights lawsuits. A second potential prop profit center is what I call <coughs> Operation Trump Cakes. This effort would involve deploying civil rights testers into liberal hotbeds like San Francisco and Greenwich Village in New York, among other places, and ask that cakes be made that say things like, Christians for Trump, <laughs> gays for Trump, African Americans for Trump and women for Trump. And let's just see if those businesses and those customized product companies will make those cakes or products. And if they won't, then you may very well have a lawsuit for discrimination like we see before the Supreme Court on, 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 of, of the Christian bakers. The third profit center um, is Operation Economic Geek. Uh, for those of you at George Mason, this bud's for you. Um, Operation Economic Geek basically takes advantage of the fact that most local governments are broke. And as a consequence of being broke, they use user fees as illegal taxes. A user fee can be charged by government for it, assuming that the fee is comparable to the cost of providing the services. So if you go to the local town, if you go to the town and they charge you $50 to record a mortgage, that's fine. 
but the reality is if they charge you like $1,000 to record the mortgage when it only costs them 50 bucks, that's not a user fee, that's an illegal tax. And you can sue and make money for you and yes, indeed, for the plaintiff's lawyer that sues. Uh, the, le the next example is what I call Operation Looney Liberal. Now, this is really simple. You identify a prominent liberal and find a way to sue them, a la, a la, a la Harvey <laughs> Weinstein. <laughs> Now, how do you do this? You say, you say, hey, Mark, how do I do this? I mean, I live in Montana and whatnot. How do I do it? I'm going to give you a simple way to think about it, OK? Because I don't believe in donors. I believe in going out there and doing it yourself and winning for yourself, OK? I don't like to be held back by third parties. Go win because it's right and it helps you. OK, go to Google. Google the name of a local liberal organization or a local liberal and put it in the same sentence as unpaid intern. <laughs> You may find out that the local liberal organization down the street from you has been using unpaid interns. And as we all know, under the Obama's and Obama administration's and current interpretation of labor law, basically throughout the United States, if you've used unpaid interns in the last many years, that is illegal. They were supposed to be employees. You can sue. You can make money. Get attorney's fees. And again, um, that's awesome. So, so find that kid in your local community, add the class action complaint, and stir and voila, instant money from the left. And my last example before I close, Your Honor, is you guys have been reading about this Missouri Attorney General, and you know the Missouri Attorney General is investigating Google out there. Now I don't, you know, he's investigating Google's practices and how to use privacy information, how to use data, and all this stuff. I don't know a lot about it, but here's the question I have to conservatives. So I seem to recall when the Attorney General several years ago decided to go after and investigate the tobacco industries, the entire plaintiff's bar in America jumped on and made money. Why are conservative groups not doing that in Missouri right now? Just a question. So to close, the people that prepared this excellent lunch today for the Federalist Society were not motivated to do so because they're con concerned for us or our well-being. They served this lunch today because they were getting paid for the services. And just like Adam Smith explained in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations, we rely on the baker, the butcher, and the brewer uh, for our dinner, not from their benevolence, but for their self-interest. So likewise, I urge all conservatives in the conservative political uh, movement and otherwise to look for finding opportunities for Lawsuit Inc. to sue in effect for conservatives, not because it's good for conservatives, but because it's good for the people suing and good for the lawyers. And then, as these lawsuits are prosecuted, we on the right and in the conservative public interest legal movement can also begin to experience what I like to call better living through litigation. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Grieva, should, should cons we haven't actually ever defined conservative litigation is conservative litigation about making money for conservatives vis-a-vis -vis other people in society? Or is conservative litigation about promoting smaller government? Is conservative litigation about promoting deregulation um, and making sure that lawyers are not enriched at the, um, you know, off on the backs of the plaintiffs who might be more deserving perhaps? Or is conservative litigation this religious liberties thing that the Chamber of Commerce members don't seem to be all for? What, perhaps some are. Uh, if there's a, you know, you see many amici briefs from many of the members on, uh, against many of the religious liberties groups. What is conservative litigation? Um, litigation that's broadly consistent with um, our sort of general principles. I think one of the salutary things that has happened in the conservative libertarian movement is specialization and diversification. Um, and I think many sort of, of the aspects um, of, sort of conservative libertarian politics in general are now pretty well covered from um, religious liberty to free speech litigation to you know guns to generally um, anti-regulatory or limited government um, purposes so I think that 
looking back, the movement has has a great deal to to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Did any of you have any comments about your colleagues' remarks? Yes. <laughs> Um, well, first, I'd like to say that I, I, I'm glad Mark spoke after me rather than before me, because I, I wouldn't have been able to follow that. But um, I do want to disagree with the idea that we want to aggrandize lawyers and, and, and try to uh, use that to sort of harass the left uh, through the power of litigation. And I, I, I think that's a long-term losing strategy for us. And, and while we shouldn't unilaterally disarm and, and, and certainly use the tools that are out there, to, to say that we, we want to um, expand the power of lawyers to, to, who, to harass political enemies, I, I, I think is very dangerous in the long run because at the end of the day, the, the legal community is, is always gonna be disproportionately uh, on the left, just the nature of uh, the rule of lawyers and, 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 and the idea of expanding the power of, of what lawyers can do goes along very well with the idea of, of, um, of paternalistic government uh, and, 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 and limiting freedoms. And we, we, I, 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 and I, I think this goes to the consequentialist argument that I, I, I was making, that we, we need to think about limiting the influence of lawyers in our society. And, and, and while we can applaud that there's no longer a gawker, is it really a good thing that uh, gawker was undone because uh, a judge wasn't really following what the First Amendment limitations are and, and was not permitting them to have the opportunity to have an appeal bond. Uh, who's going to lose in the long run when, uh, when there aren't good appeal bonds? It's, it's not going to be the gawkers of the world. It's going to be the small businesses. It's going to be the pillars of the community. Uh, and, and the incentives of lawyers are always not going to be doing what's best for the social good, but to be going after the deep pockets. And, and we need to be very careful about uh, what we're triggering uh, when, 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 we, when we push that. And I, I'm sure Mark has a response to that. Anyone else want to be heard before we proceed with other questions? Okay. Well, we do have some other questions, and we're going to take questions from the audience in a minute, but I, I, had a, I did have a couple of questions. You were talking earlier that litigation is a slow method of accomplishing your objectives and that that can be very frustrating for people. Do you think that the conservative, the, the people who are bringing this conservative public interest um, litigation, do they use the other types of tools that are available for quicker resolution? Do they use the tools that are available you know, in the media, in other, in other ways to get quicker results to accomplish your goals? Or do they turn more to litigation first? Do you, do you, I'm happy to do you comment on that, but I think I need. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I speak for my experience. I think uh, certainly at the chamber, and I think for a lot of the business community, um, litigation was and is really perceived as more of a last resort in the in the toolbox and and but it critically important last resort because having a serious credible litigation threat on the back end can very much shape what the regulatory um, outcome can be on the front end and so I think if, if you're truly trying to, and, and whatever the mission may be of any particular public interest group, to, I, I think litigation is an incredibly important pillar, but it, it shouldn't really be your only, um, your only way of going about it. It doesn't mean that, I mean, there are many, I think, situations where other, there, there's a combination of groups that can get you to the same place. It doesn't all have to be housed in the same organization. Um, but it, it really, um, you know, one of the, the efforts that, that I took when I went into the litigation center and, and the other folks that were involved at the time was to try to make sure 
that the litigation wasn't the afterthought. Everything had fallen apart and people ran in and said, okay, now can you, can you sue on this? And really trying to acclimate those advocates, the lobbyists, the, those folks talking to the regulators, talking on the Hill, to what actual legal arguments look like. And so for anybody who's ever had this experience where you have bad regulations come and they say, can you go sue on it? And you realize there were, there were no litigation type arguments preserved in the regulatory process. And so I guess my urging would be for anybody who wants to do the type of APA regulatory work um, that, that I was involved in, you need to get involved very, very early for a whole host of practical reasons that go to the financing and to making sure everybody understands the seriousness of where this could be headed, um, but also to bake in and preserve all of the types of arguments um, that you might want at your disposal when you get to the litigation phase. And so you really need write-alongs from the litigation groups into all of the other tools um, that, are, that are available. Okay. But Mark, do you see, the, do you see uh, the conservative public interest people do you, doing a good job of getting their message out there? I do. I, I think the, the conservative public um, interest legal movement is excellent. I'm a huge supporter of, of all those nonprofits and all those organizations, um, I, I do think they do a great job in you know bringing strategic lawsuits and generating publicity with op-eds in the Wall Street Journal and going on Fox News and talking about those cases. I think they all do a great job and they're excellent. You know, my comment, of course, is that we're conservative, so we don't rely on like seven people to do things in any other context. We rely on the marketplace and ordinary conservatives and ordinary Americans in middle of K Topeka, Kansas to do things and not rely on Washington. And I think that the current model of the conservative public interest approach here is that we're relying on the NRA or we rely on the Institute for Justice or we rely on the Pacific Legal Foundation to do the excellent work they do and they do do excellent work. It's just not enough in today's world. There's too much work to be done and basically you're, you're, you know, there's stuff that can be done on, in Alaska and in Montana and, and all over New York and, and everywhere in the United States and all these towns and localities, there's just not enough of a conservative you know, organizational infrastructure to do these things. And my question is how do you get ordinary Americans, ordinary people that love the country to actually take up, pick up the baton of freedom and conservatism and traditional American values and run with it? And I think that's the question that we really need to answer. Uh, not like do we have like, you know, really good 12 non-for-profit organizations we do. It's just not enough in today's world. I noticed that none of you discussed a role for big law in this process. You know, we talked about perhaps the plaintiff's bar. We talked about the, you know, the profit-seeking conservative crusader. We talked about it from a, you know, getting donors and setting up through these institutes. But does big law have a role to play? I mean, we get lots of um, amici briefs these days from all sorts of people, and progressive public interest people seem to be very um, adept uh, uh, at getting big law to come in, and you get not just one or two, you get 10 amicus briefs in cases of import. Um, but you don't really see big law doing, at least at least in my circuit and what I read from the Supreme Court, and perhaps I'm wrong, and maybe you could correct me, that, that the, the big law is involved in these conser what you have termed conservative public interest law. How much of a difference do the amicus briefs make? Well, some of the people think that they make a lot of difference. In fact, some of the justices talk about how they're helpful, and some of them quote them in their things. I'm not a big fan. I think that they're fraught with peril personally. I'm, I'm not on this panel today, so I won't talk long. But I think they're fraught with peril because sometimes they have facts in them that are not actually verifiable and haven't been Daubert challenged and otherwise verified, and then they creep into opinions. So I, I find Bapika's briefs fraught with peril. But... I'm just saying, it doesn't seem like big law is, is at the table. Am, am, am I wrong about that? Yeah, as a guy that came out of big law at Skadden Arps, um, the problem with big law is I think they all uh, toe the line of the other side. I think that they're not going to do anything that's not purely political cor politically correct, um, and they're going to take the messages from the Googles of the world, Silicon Valley, and I think they're going to be giving you the answers that you would expect to get out of an editorial in the New York Times or the Washington Post. So I do think that there's a, uh, there is, a, I think big law is at the table, 
they're just on the other side of us. And I don't think there's any way to change that as a practical matter. Yeah, I, I would just say to that, I mean, I, I, I think we're speaking or painting with a really broad brush on that point. I do think it is tougher in the big law environment to push on, on the conservative side. Um, again, I know I keep saying, I don't think the business community agenda is, is completely simpatico with the conservative agenda. Um, certainly, we had some fantastic uh, support from uh, big law, but I also know a lot of folks, I think even just sitting in this room who are affiliated with big law do a lot of good work, a lot of righteous work um, for the conservative movement. Unfortunately, they often have to do it very quietly, <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes they, they lose the race to getting to decide which side um, they, they will come in on. But I'm, I'm hopeful that things like the attendance rate um, at the Federal Society suggest that a lot of the people in big law that are in leadership positions and have some ability to touch the pro bono world and the recruiting, et cetera, are sort of really reaching out and making an effort to ensure that conservatives at big law have opportunities to be supportive too. So I don't want to throw everyone at big law under the bus. No, I think that's right. First Liberty, for example, has done uh, really good work in terms of creating a pro bono program and, and working with big law in, in, in on the religious liberty issues, though those are in individual cases rather than uh, some of the more high-profile high cases. But uh, I, I, I think that's something that Federalist Society members in big law just need to do to uh, sort of protect uh, the interests and, and, and try to work within their system to, to make sure that what they have as pro bono isn't all one-sided. Okay, thank you, thank you. We're going to open it up for questions now. Oddly, my question directly flows from what you were just discussing. Perfect. Howard Lim, Jr., uh, Secretary of the New York State Conservative Party. I was wondering if there are opportunities within public interest uh, litigation for practicing attorneys to satisfy their pro, bro, pro bono requirements in, th in those jurisdictions which require it. Uh, can you get legal assistance in 20, 30, 50 hour bites if you right. give somebody some research to do or some editing to do? Uh, or is it more likely that in a jurisdiction like New York, if you were to submit work like this to the Bar Association, you'd be involved in litigation immediately with them coming back to you, them uh, coming back to you and saying, "Well, you're not helping in indigenous people or or, uh, or, or people uh, who are in economic need, so we're disqualifying uh, the work you're doing as potentially pro bono." Who would like to address that? I I think I mean my experience, which is not not really current, right? It it dates back. Um, my sense of it is that the critical piece that you mentioned is in 20 hour bites, right? And that excludes the possibility of having some of these law firms do an awful lot of litigation with us, which is open-ended. You don't know the time commitment at the front end. You can't go to your pro bono partner and say, you know, you'll see me again in three years when this thing is over. Um, that's not going to fly, so it would have to be bits and pieces, and I think uh, one of the reasons why the amicus work is so pronounced and, and why, you know, that's a manageable commitment. You know um, that there's a time limit on it. It's a one-shot deal, and you can go to your partners and, and ask them to do you that favor. Um, uh, my sense is that, you know, the, the law firms differ in the extent to which um, uh, th th they're uh, tolerant of sort of politically incorrect um, positions or or lawsuits, but just to I mean impress the, 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 the I mean when I was young and <laughs> you know we did these things, Hopwood versus State of Texas litigated that with Ted Olson um, and a gang of lawyers at. Um, Gibson Dunn, I think if you tried that on them today, they wouldn't do it anymore. I mean, the, the law world has just changed tremendously. That's no longer doable. At least not unless the lawyers get paid. Maybe at a reduced rate, but they're getting paid one way or the other. 
Thank you. Next question. I'm Kent Scheidegger with the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation, and I'm usually on the defending side in most cases. Um, and an issue that Kate mentioned is that the other side, when they're initiating the case, generally gets you into an unfavorable venue. But it's actually even worse than that. Uh, through abuse of the uh, related case rules, they very often can steer it to a particular judge. Um, one of the worst cases was the California prisoner case where the three-judge panel was judges Reinhardt, Carlson, and Henderson, which is pretty much the criminal dream team of the entire federal judiciary. Um, I was wondering if uh, there's been any thought given to working for some changes in the rules uh, as far as limiting venues or um, limiting the ability to get things to a particular judge. Okay. Who would like to take that? You want to take it? No, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, it's certainly not something that I had worked on. Um, I, I think having some venue choice is a good thing as a plaintiff or a petitioner. Um, I have never used or, you know, try not to use forum shopping as a dirty word inherently. I think a good lawyer does take into account that there are variations from one court to the next. Um, I think there are a lot of abuses in the forum shopping world, but but I certainly as a, you know, on the public interest litigation side of the equation, having that ability to do some forum shopping um, and find judges who might actually be receptive to the arguments one's making is important as to the, the intricacies of the specific rules within in the Ninth Circuit or beyond. It's not something I've given a lot of thought to. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Cindy Crawford from Cause of Action Institute. I think we're probably all aware of the tactic of sue and settle um, to use to expand the reach of regulatory agencies and to move the law in a direction that maybe Congress didn't intend it to go. And it, it's a little counterintuitive, but I was wondering if anyone on the panel has ever experienced the use of that tactic in the opposite direction, trying to push the law back to where Congress intended it to be or to narrow the reach of the agency. Um, I actually wrote about this in uh, my book, Disrobed. Specifically, I talked about how I always found it interesting how the left, I mean, we understand it's kind of like the consent decree question. I mean, for those of you who don't know how it works, basically you get a liberal organization will commence a lawsuit on behalf of their cause in San Francisco, and like the mayor of San Francisco will sort of settle it with them with a consent decree that's going to last, you know, a thousand years. Uh, so that no matter what the change in administration in San Francisco might be, that policy that's almost always liberal will remain. We see this in the policing community, obviously, with consent decrees in Baltimore and the like, uh, where Obama administration, you know, did these things. And, and my question uh, that I raised in, in, in my book was, uh, why don't we ever do that? In other words, why doesn't you know a Republican attorney general ever sue on gun on behalf of gun owners in Alabama in front of an Alabama federal judge and get some sort of nationwide consent decree on something that's good for us? Instead, we make the mistake that I sort of am talking about today, which is that we let them play offense on consent decrees, and we get in power, and all we say is no more consent decrees. And they get back in power and they go back to consent decrees. And we essentially have a one-way ratchet in the law, left to left to left to left. And the best we ever do is freeze the ball. We never score points. And I think the best way um, to basically teach liberals not to use these tactics against us is to punish them with using the tactic back against them. And I think if we actually had consent decrees and did this sort of sue and settle in red states, we might teach them, hey, not a good idea. Now, you may ask me, has this ever occurred historically? And the answer is absolutely yes. Remember, you all know Morrison versus Olson and Scalia's dissent about, oh, you know, independent counsel is bad and all that, all of which is true, by the way. But remember, Bill Clinton signed, you know, Republicans used to hate the independent counsel statute forever because they would go after our team with liberal prosecutors. And then what happened, of course, is Bill Clinton renews the independent counsel statute, and then Ken Starr comes down the pike and uses it against Bill Clinton. Guess what happened? People forget the history. That statute that Bill Clinton signed into law via a bipartisan agreement went away. That's an example where the left loved a weapon of war in litigation, meaning you know, an independent counsel statute. How did we get rid of it? 
not by argumentation. We used it against them in the Bill, by the Bill Clinton era, and then they got rid of it. If you don't punch them in the face, they don't learn the lesson, and they won't stop doing it. Next question. Uh, Jay Schweikert, uh, Cato Institute. Um, sort of a, as a follow-up, actually, to what, uh, Mark, what you were just saying, I, I suppose I, I want to push back on that idea a little bit. I, I think I, I, w I was thinking about this most in the context of um, some of the like freedom of association lawsuits that you were proposing. And isn't there a pretty significant risk that the I, I, it seems like there's already the suggestion that, oh, any, any, anyone who's talking about freedom of speech or religious liberty, that's really just a cover for, you know, being a bigot or discrimination. And there's, I, I think just the notion that that's an actual general principle that all Americans should be able to agree with is itself under attack. And if we sort of turn around and start saying after we've been defending the, you know, freedom of association, freedom of conscience, uh, you know, religious liberty of small uh, professionals, and then we start suing progressives on sort of the same grounds, doesn't that completely undercut any credibility that we have and suggest that actually this isn't a general principle of a free society and it's all just politics? I, I think that the answer to the question is one of strategy. It's who is we? Um, the way the left has been so effective is you have the liberal politicians, yes, but then you have like their agents that are not technically official agents of the left political arm. So you have plaintiff's lawyers that are suing for like liberal causes, but they're not technically speaking part of like the democratic operations. So the way I see it is you could strategically have, you know, your official organizations that stand for certain principles of federalism and, and constitutionalism and all that, and that's all great, but then you can have essentially, um, you know, for-profit plaintiff's lawyers on our side looking to make money you know, basically, you know, beating the other side up. And technically, those are separate armies. They're not actually the same. So I think that could get away around some of your concerns about, you know, you know, public attacks because, you know, look, when FDR was elected president, he, he had a meeting, this is well, well chronicled, that he sat down with liberal organizations and said, now that I've been elected, I need you to go out there and bring pressure on me. So he basically wanted to respond to the community putting pressure on him to do the New Deal. And I think that what we have here is, while conservatives, generally speaking, we like free markets. We believe in local control. And yet, when we talk about these issues, for some reason, we think that the Mitch McConnells of the world have the answers. The people in Washington in these you know, think tanks have the answers. My argument is, no, the answers reside with you in the middle of America and not in the nation's capital. And uh, I don't think there needs to be a one-size-fits-all conservatism. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? No? Okay. Hi, Alexandra Harrison. Um, so on the one hand, I agree with you. It's great to build a consensus. But to reference your earlier point about Masterpiece Cake Shop, I think there you have the evangelicals against the libertarians, right? And so to use your example of Trump cakes, well, that's all great if you think that the state should require people to sell goods resulting in artistic expression that violate their personal beliefs. There's a decent legal argument for that, but I don't think everyone in this room agrees with that. So at what point do you say, here's where we really need to get over ourselves and build consensus, and at what point do we say, it's a big tent, we don't always agree? Okay. Does anyone want to take that? That apparently, uh, I guess it could be in sync in this case if the libertarians want you to be able to do business with who you yeah. want and the, the, so do the evangelicals in this context perhaps, and I'm not going to comment on the merits of that. Yeah, but, and I think but, this but is do a... do you think that there are points where there's not, there's not consensus? Again, I think this is a great example of kind of the point I was making earlier, which is right now, you know, the left... Uh, not that I, I don't have a particular view on the homosexuality issue or the, any of these particular things, but, but you know, the, right now from the left's point of view, 
they're able to go on the attack using these civil rights against you know Christian bakers, and they think that's all well and good. They think that's really awesome, right? But then my point is, if all of a sudden you start using those same statues and those same tactics against their bakers and their customized products, and now all of a sudden you know the bakery in Greenwich Village has to put out you know 5,000 cupcakes that say I love Donald Trump or something. Then you may actually get them to say, geez, you know, well, I, you know, I understand this other argument, but I don't like doing it either. Then you might actually get to some sort of mutual bipartisan understanding that maybe we should just let people be free and make their choices if they're adults as opposed to a one-size-fits-all nanny state, which they seem to think is really good when they run the nanny state. Yeah. Uh, my, my view on it is just, I guess, I haven't thought about this nearly as, as long as you have, uh, just more litigation that's of a, litig of a method and a type that we don't like and don't agree with doesn't seem like the way to solve the litigation problem. And, and what I have trouble believing is that there becomes this eureka moment of disarmament instead of just a further increase and in running to the courts for every single problem. And, you know, when I teach law school, it is amazing to me. I'll bring in, you know, current interest news stories of any given day and ask the students, like, start brain, you know, what, what's your, your litigation answer to it? And everybody's got a lot of lawsuit. Everybody's got an idea of how they can sue and some for, to make money out of it and some just generally to bring the lawsuit. And I think this kind of goes back to, to my point earlier of I think you have a fundamental question for conservatives and for conservative groups of which pieces matter most to them. And while I think there's an incredibly important place for public interest litigation, conservative public interest litigation in the context of this particular conference in fighting the, the administrative state, I think having a situation where you're just further aggrandizing the power of judges to really be dealing with a lot of issues that should never make their way into a courtroom uh, you know, I don't see a lot of judges eventually giving up that view of taking over these decrees and, and the power that can come with that just because both sides have amped it up. I think we, we, we potentially just make the problem dramatically more worse. I appreciate the, the desire for the creativity and I do think there are some places where it could work. And as someone who's done a lot of fundraising, I'm all for anything that allows people not to do fundraising. Um, but but I, I do think we have to be, you know, have some level of purity. Um, and everybody's, every group's gonna have to figure out what purity is for them in terms of what tools they're gonna use. I just wanna say that Judge Elrod is excellent and thank God she's on the court. But she's on the court because of a civil lawsuit brought by Paula Jones against Bill Clinton, where Bill Clinton lied under oath, got impeached, and basically allowed us to have George W. Bush beat Al Gore in 2000. So the effect of that civil lawsuit, right, not brought by a nonprofit organization, it was a civil lawsuit for money, allows us to have Judge Elrod presiding over us today, and I say thank God for that civil lawsuit. Can I just... Um, that, that's... Uh, Mark, I, I just disagree with this. I mean, th those kinds of lawsuits, the bakery lawsuit, that is the stuff of tyranny, whether it comes from the left or the right. <laughs> and, you know, before we contemplate that, I mean, I... Sorry, I want to take a shower. Uh, I want to say... <laughs> one, one, I just want to say one thing um, about the, the young lady who asked the question about evangelicals and libertarians. Um, it actually seems to, I mean, sure, there are lots of disagreements about abortion or, you know, gay marriage or whatever, all right. Um, but it seems to me um, that over the course of the past 10, 15 years, there's been much more common ground among sort of religious constituencies and sort of hardcore libertarians. and. Um, the reason is quite simply that we're discovering, uh, you know, what the French clergy discovered around 1800. It's really, really bad to lose a revolution. And the revolution we've lost is a sexual revolution. And now they're going to come after us, and they will not rest until we all beg for mercy. And so, uh, in terms of sort of being attuned to what the regulatory state, the administrative state can do to you. 
Um, you know, that constituency has become a lot more diverse, but also a lot more cohesive and a lot broader. And that's all to the good. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a First Amendment expert, but I have sort of a vague recollection that there was a major federal litigation involving the Ten Commandments on like a public park or a, a, in the courthouse in Alabama, and the Ten Commandments came down. And in contrast, today in America, we have a constitutional right to gay marriage, which may be fine, but I'm trying to understand if it seems to me that from a religious liberties point of view, of the conservatives' point of view, it seems like the, the trends in the courts have not been favorable from, from my sort of outside, taking a look inside point of view. So, you know, when things don't work out, I say try new tactic because otherwise you're going to just keep losing. And I don't like to bring a knife to a gunfight. That's why I think we should sue them. I, I, I think there might be some middle possible ground here. And, and, and I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to being the moderate on a panel. But... Uh, <laughs> So, for example, we're seeing um, the Fair Housing Act being expanded uh, to the idea that uh, disparate impact can count as, as racial discrimination. And if that's really the case, then, well, maybe we should be using it to, say, challenge rent control and the effect that that has on minorities. And then let the left decide, do they want to get rid of rent control or do they want to get rid of this really overbroad statute? And maybe that's the wrong answer because the, they would always decide, let's uh, go as broad as we want. Or uh, maybe the danger is, is that uh, when we have a, a fully left-wing bench, uh, they'll just say, we can have both. Um, but. Uh, I, I, I think there are possibilities to use, and, and one of the things that attracted me to the, to the class action objection uh, was, was the idea of using litigation against the plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, but they, 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 there, there does seem to be some honor among thieves, and I, I haven't seen any plaintiff's lawyers bringing uh, antitrust suits against other plaintiff's lawyers for colluding uh, to raise rates to uh, class members. So we, we can see. Okay. We'll take another question now. Hi, I'm Bob Popper. I'm from Judicial Watch. And this has been a, just a great debate to hear. We love you guys, by the way. Great okay. job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, listen, um, I think you guys have you've hit the point, which is that I think the conservative worldview is not consistent with litigating. I think that the liberal worldview is. Um, litigating is, and I say this as you know, a public interest litigator on the right, litigating is corrosive of social institutions. It is a transaction cost. It is opposed to the free market. Um, it is a game we may always lose in the long run. And perhaps the best thing a conservative can do is not start a lawsuit, but start a business. And it's just a different field where success is more assured. Um, but you know, I, I, you all discussed what I was thinking, so perhaps this isn't a question. I did, you know, want to say to Mr. Frank, perhaps that's the best solution is to find the clever lawsuit. Um, I mean, in, in a way, it's analogous to judicial restraint. Conservatives can never win that game because if conservative judges restrain themselves and liberal judges do not. In the long run, the law will tend one way. So, you know, perhaps it's a depressing conclusion and we are all doomed, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been very interesting to hear. Thank you. Well, without, kind without, of would, oh, I'll ahead. just say one quick thing. Without getting into the context of how these questions are asked, uh, when I've asked people in a public policy context, um, how would you like the world to be, or you know, what do you think should happen with an agency, or what do you think should happen with this court, or whatnot? Let me tell you the answer I always look for, which gets you the A plus when I uh, when I do the questioning. The A plus answer goes along these lines. Well, I have two answers to that. The answer as to what I would like the world to look like is this. We you know 19, 1890 economic liberty, economic rights for example. But we don't live there. We live here. And in today's world, this is the answer given today's world. So the world in which I would like to live in is the world described, frankly, by all of you in the room, which is there's like no lawsuits. There's minimal, minimal government, minimal courts, minimal... I want to live in that world too. 
But I have to answer the question of how do we get to that world given where we are today? And that is what I struggle to answer, and that's why I think my arguments may appear radical at first sense, but I'm trying to answer a difficult question of we are at sea in tough waters. How do we get back to the part where we never should have lived as an American legal institutions, but we did, and now we're stuck in the storm? How do we get back to where we never should have left? That's what I'm trying to struggle with, and that's what I think my answer goes to. Thank you. We'll have another question. Thanks. Well, my name is Bonnie Wachtel. I've really en enjoyed the conversation. I draw a distinction between those who argue that we shouldn't be trying to develop offense because we'll lose versus we shouldn't be trying to develop offense because we really don't care for that tactic as much as I am a, a fan of all things Michael Grieba. <laughs> I also, going back a long ways, you know, I remember occasions like Bush v. Gore mm -hmm. where there was a tremendous concern that the, the conservatives would just be too principled to develop an opinion out of the Supreme Court that anybody might criticize, which they came through. And some of the attorneys general lawsuits coming from places like Oklahoma, Scott Pruitt, that were a godsend, I think, for some of the concerns going forward there. To me, this is very analogous to what we should be thinking about in terms of our defense posture. We don't like drones and cyber and fighting back and all of that stuff. We're only doing this because others are attacking us. And the goal of all of this is hopefully to get to some sort of a resolution, just like with the independent counsel law, where all of these tools can be put aside. You know, and in terms of an aha moment, well, there was an aha moment with the Soviet Union. Mutual assured destruction worked. It's, it backed everybody back down. So to that extent, I would say I am, I am more in the, in, of a spirit with what Mark is approaching, and even if I didn't agree with anything he said, I just love that image of piranhas. Just can't get that out of my okay. mind anyway. Thank, thank you, thank you for your comments. Well, we did promise the audience at the beginning that we would tell them if they wanna do this kind of work, what you would need to do to do this kind of work. And we, wanna, we don't wanna end with doom or sadness or problem. So if you want to do this kind of work, it, or if you're maybe not a young lawyer, maybe you're in the mid of your career and you said, I want to make a difference in the world or whatever, uh, what, what should people be doing? How do, how do they sign up for your, your plan or, what did, or how do they sign up for your plan? What, what, what should people be doing to get more involved if, if this is something they feel is a calling? Well, uh, I, I mean, become a good lawyer and there will always be a demand for your services, whether it's, it's in the private sector or in the public sector. Uh, and whether you, you, you take those skills and, and develop a pro bono program at, at your law firm that you can then use to help existing uh, conservative public interest litigation or to engage in your own pro bono litigation that, that has a conservative flavor to it. Uh, or whether you take your resume and then uh, 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 apply to um, an IJ or a CEI down the line. So uh, th those opportunities are available. Yeah, let me just add one thing to that, uh, and it's apropos uh, something Bonnie uh, just uh, it said. Um, one of the best places to learn this stuff is a state AG's office or a state SG's office. And um, Bonnie's entirely right. That is one of the things that the conservative movement did very, very well and developed very, very well over the past decade. Many of these lawsuits were, you know, against the Obama administration, or especially on energy, but also other things, were cooperative projects between sometimes the chamber or other business groups, states. Um, and 
public interest law firms, all of that worked exceptionally well. Obviously, that model needs some sort of revamping and rethinking now, but nonetheless, I mean, we, sh I mean, it's there. Um, and, I mean, you know, SGs are sort of public interest lawyers with a badge, and um, we shouldn't sit around and say, oh, no, you really have to be a C3 outfit or a C4 outfit to do any meaningful work on behalf of the public. It can be done in government. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I, I would echo what Ted had said earlier. I mean, trying to, in terms of attracting um, really good people into the nonprofit world in this public interspace, I mean, the work is incredibly interesting. It's a ton of fun, you know, to just end on the positive, to do something you believe in and to do it in in the kinds of cases that are making the headlines, at least of Law 360, if not like what normal people read. Um, you know, it's you, you really are and, and, and shaping, crafting a lawsuit, right? Every, anyone who's been on both sides of the equation, there's, you know, a ton of fun in the defense side, but there's nothing like sitting there and saying, we got a problem at what moment, where, how, et cetera. There's no harder paper to write in, in legal practice, in my view, than a complaint. And, and that brainstorming and having people who consider the issue incredibly important, so important that at least in the model that we've been talking about, you know, they're donating their money um, to have you push forward with a particular uh, piece of litigation. I think it's inc incredibly thrilling and should be attractive to people. It's not always an area I thought about, certainly not something I contemplated when I left law school, um, but I had a, a tremendous amount of fun um, in the last six years at the chamber. Mark? I mean, I think these are all fine suggestions, which means go get a prestigious job somewhere, learn a lot, get famous, and then after that, go do what you want. Um, let me answer the question from the point of view of people that, you know, can't get into AG's office, don't want to take the pay cut, are just ordinary lawyers or ordinary citizens that don't want to devote their entire lives to this. Um, if you go out and Google litigation finance and crowdsourcing and all these things, you will find, and I don't know the names of the websites right here, uh, but there exist, there are, law, there are websites out there where people are crowdsourcing litigation financing, and this is not just for lawyers, but for non-lawyers, it's like 2,500 bucks, 500 bucks, 5,000 bucks, you can put this money in into various lawsuits. Um, if I had like a full-time job somewhere and I only had so much time to devote to this and I wanted to do something, I would be looking for interesting things that bother me in my community, that I think there might be a way to do something about it legally. Then I would touch fingers with the crowdsourcing slash litigation finance world, if it couldn't do it yourself. And I would do these things, and here's the kicker. The economic argument, even if you do some of these cases and you don't get paid, is that there's a different way to get paid, and that's through earned media. The one thing we can agree about Donald Trump is nobody used earned media better than Donald Trump in the history of um, the American poli political world, right? He used earned media and this free coverage every night to just win the White House. Uh, if you find an interesting litigation that you decide to do, even though it may be worth not a lot of money, the media will eat it up because they need content 24-7 now. So you bring some, you know, sort of interesting case in your community, People will write about it, they will link to it, it will be discussed, so you will become a more successful famous lawyer with press clippings now that you can then go out and get better clients and richer clients and bigger cases because now you've built up your portfolio, if you will. So that's how I would do it if you can't go be the Solicitor General of the United States and then go from there. Okay. This really robust discussion is one of the best things about the Federalist Society, the rich intellectual diversity. Thank you to our panelists.